talk on epigei surgery. I'm going to keep this limited to 30, 40 minutes. It's just a quick run through. You don't need to know much about the actual bits of upper GI surgery, it's not that important. You don't need to know how to do a real why. You don't need to know how to do an end-to-end -end anastomosis of a, a, a esophagus. You don't need to know how to do a Whipple's procedure. All you need to know is those things exist. They're out there. What you need to do is just be able to approach something logically, be able to give your differentials, be able to talk about it and be able to problem solve a little bit. And then you need to be able to pass your oscopies, don't you? Is it, You've done it, you finished your exams and whatnot, just, or do you just have ask examinations now? Both, both, both in about three weeks. Both in three weeks, so you've got a written exam. And a week, and what's that? Is that just like clinical scenarios, like is it EMQs, MCQs, extended matching, all yeah. that kind of stuff, and then you have OSCEs after that? Yeah. Right. That's a bit rubbish, but that's okay, but you don't need to do. <laughs> You don't have to know that much about the actual surgery itself, but you need to be able to pass your OSCEs, don't you? So you need sort of a, a logical framework in which to approach things so that, you know, when your mind goes blank, and it will, <laughs> you'll have something to say. So it's like when you have surgical complications, you, you know, if someone just asks you what's the surgical complications of um, esophageal surgery or a carotid endocterectomy, You've got those three things now. You've got early complications, late complications, infections, bleeding, and damage to local structures. No one's going to say boo to you. They're going to be like, that's fine. That's totally fine. They've got, you've got a level head. You can approach it. It's fine. And then they'll just ask you a little bit about the details. They're not asking. They're not going to want amazing things from you. They just want to know that you've got a logical thought process. So anyway, oh yeah, don't put your finger in it. Uh, yeah, remember to do a full examination as well, and to state you do a full examination in your OSCEs as well. So yeah, I'll examine the hernia orifices and do a PR examination. It's all very important to say that. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to talk about dysphagia. I'm going to go through some case scenarios, some things that you may have touched on before, but maybe sort of locked away in your distant memory. Uh, do a couple of GI search. I bet you've done that. Have you done the A, B, C, D to death now? Are you a bit over it? Yeah, but... We'll quick, we'll quick, uh, there's a couple of surgical emergencies that just to be aware of, but we don't have, well, just whiz past them so you, you're aware of those things uh, and they'll be fine. Uh, GI surgery is massive, so you can split it into esophageal or gastric type of things, so anything that goes from the gut up to your stomach. And then there's the other subsection of stuff, which is liver, pancreas, and your gallbladder and whatnot. So those are the kind of two broad dimensions of it. Um, but just to start us off, as everyone got a system for approaching x-rays, you won't get just a plain film x-ray, you'll get a, with your OSCEs or whatever, you'll get a case, they'll give you a little bit of history, a little bit about the scenario, so they say, oh, this is a 40-year-old lady who's come in, she's got a bit of retrosternal pain, a bit of reflux-type symptoms, uh, and has anyone got a, just a quick process about how to approach, you know, a quick spiel about what they'd say for an x-ray? We've got all that. Do you, want, do you want to just say what they say? Do you like the main clinical details? Yeah. And then you do, well I do, uh, it's something like a pinch my toy dinosaur. And yeah, it's yeah. Soft tissue, bones, flora, yeah. mediastinum, yeah. um, tricky. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. That's all stuff you want to cover. Um, my top tip for OSCEs, and which is, you'd say all that, you'd have your little spiel, would be this is a, uh, Mrs. Smith, the 42-year-old lady who's presented on this date, this is an AP radiograph of the chest. The most, and then you'd say, the most striking abnormality on this chest is hiatus hernia, hiatus hernia which is in the, uh, which looks to be a sliding hiatus hernia, as it's in the left costophrenic, towards the left costophrenic angle of the left base. And then you could say, as part of my system, I would then do soft tissues, bones, airways, mediastinum, heart. So, because they'll get bored with going, you know, outwards, inwards, or going through all the bits, just, if you see something, just point out immediately and then say you've got a system to deal with it, and they'll love you forever. So those are hiatus hernias. That's just uh, what it is. It's just a quick spot diagnosis that you'd see on a, on a plain film. The two different types, sliding, which is more common, and the parasophageal, 
which is left, come back. Uh, okay, so let's do some cases. So we've got a uh, first case is a, a, a 68 year old who's complained with difficulty in swallowing. He's noticed that there's some solid foods, but not liquids, that start to stick at the end of his chest. Been getting worse for a couple of months. Notices that there's no actual discomfort or pain when he's swallowing, but has noticed that he's lost his appetite and weight's getting down as well. He smokes 15 a day, he's a social drinker, and has no real past serious illnesses. Okay, so that's the first case. I'm going to go through a few and then we'll come back to them. Second case is a 60 year old civil servant, he's been paying of difficulty swallowing, works over two years this time. First it's mild but getting worse and feels more as getting stuck at the back of the throat. He's noticed that he started to regurgitate his food and his wife said, darling, you've got bad breath. <clears throat> his weight's not changed, but other than that, no real findings on uh, clinical examination. He takes a sip of water and splutters a little bit. <coughs> Third case. So we've got a, a canteen waitress who's aged middle-aged. Uh, she's noticed for about three or four years that she's having problems with her swallowing. Uh, she just put it down to digestion, but it's been going on for such a long time, she wants to know what's going on. So she said that the difficulty was worse when she hadn't chewed well, and now she's having a bit more trouble with her drinks, so GDP's referred her on to have a few investigations. So I guess there's the main things you want to elicit from history of dysphagia is, well, what things? Let's go back. What things do we want to know about dysphagia that's important? Is it solids or liquids or both? Solids or liquids or both? Time frame. Time frame, yeah, absolutely. So, is this a, uh, an acute problem, subacute problem, chronic problem? Weight loss. Weight loss, so we're looking for red flag features, aren't we? We're worried about cancer features. What other features of cancer or red flag features are we? Progressive symptoms. Progressive <coughs> symptoms that are getting worse. I mean, malaise. Malaise, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Malaise, weight loss, anorexia, weight loss, all those sort of constitutional symptoms, yeah, absolutely. Anything else? What do cancers do? They erode, so what do people end up doing? They end up vomiting, what do they vomit? Right. Yeah. So, hematemesis. So, there's a whole set of nice guidelines out there for red, red flag features. They're all out there. But they're all kind of things that you'd expect. Um, so yeah, so what the pattern is, whether it's progressive, intermittent, is this happening all the time? Um, and a little bit about the risk factor profile, which you'll get. And you want to know the past medical history. Did they have a history of stroke? Did they have a history of motor neuron disease? Anything neurological which will affect the mechanics of how the actual swallowing works itself. So, uh, do you want a list to learn? It's not very good, is it? If someone asks you what's a, the differential for dysphagia, it just kind of blows your mind. It's just, you don't, just don't need it. Don't need that in your life. What you need is a system to deal with it, to <coughs> break it down. So you've got a good system to how to deal with dysphagia. You're in the water Brilliant. So, and that's transferable. You can use that for any surgical obstruction of a tube. So, obstruction of a ureter, did everyone hear that by the way? So, blockage to something from out the tube. So, this page is a problem with the tube, which is the esophagus, isn't it? That's a tube. We've got tubes everywhere in the body. So, the problem comes from the tube within the actual lumen of the body, so like a foreign object. That's from, so within the actual lumen itself within the wall of the lumen itself, so intramural, or something from external compression. So any blockage of any tube, you get stuck in your vibers or whatever, you can say, you know, if it's a ureter, if it's an esophagus, if it's small bowel, large bowel, if it's your trachea, if you ask for a differential, you can say, well, there's a, either a blockage in the tube, in the wall of the tube, or from out to the side of the tube. So that's what it is. So that, there's sort of a cross-sectional diagram of a tube. So that's your esophagus. So anything that you can think about with a blockage within the actual wall of the tube. With, sorry, with from, where have I gone from? Yeah, wall of the tube itself. Sorry, did I say wall? Sorry, inside the tube itself. 
inside the esophagus, so a blockage inside. That's more intramural, isn't it? Because the growth of the cancer comes from the wall itself, or from outside the wall, so external compression. So anything inside the actual foreign body. A foreign body, absolutely. So who who has foreign bodies inside their esophagus? Children. Children, Children or Children. sorry? Elderly. Elderly people can do, yeah. I don't know if they'd be dealing with Lego at their old age, but no. <laughs> no. Uh, people with learning difficulties, people with psychiatric problems, they end up having foreign objects. Uh, what else have I said? So, that's, uh, so not polypoid tumour, wrong. So, uh, candidiasis and infection, I suppose, maybe. So, extra luminal causes, so anything that anyone can think about. <laughs> What causes compression of the tube from outside the esophagus? What would this? Anything that you can think of? Left atrium. Sorry? Left atrium. Your left atrium? If it's, if it's dilated. Massively dilated left atrium. I don't know, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, mass, yeah, really enlarged lymph nodes, which may either be primary or secondary. A massive cancer, absolutely, yeah. A massive aortic aneurysm can cause compression of the esophagus. Uh, and a retrosternal thyroid. So anything like an intramural causes can be things like strictures, cancers, uh, a webs as well. So what? who, who gets caustic strictures? People with bulimia, so people who vomit, yeah. People who vomit a lot. Children. Who swallow what? Bleach. Who swallow bleach, yeah. And then, of course, there are the systemic causes as well. So, causes which are like, causes the actual neurological problem with the effects of the problem of swallowing itself. Does that make sense? Does that help you guys? Does that make sense for other tubes? Do you think of how you'd approach it then for other tubes? We might come back to that in a minute. So, what does what do people think about this history here, and what do you think about the cardinal symptoms of the feet? Well, the cardinal problems with this uh, this mode of dysphagia, and what what do you immediately think about? Suspicious of cancer. It's massively suspicious of cancer, isn't it? You don't really even need a medical training to even. Think about it, it's just about this there, isn't it? It's cancer. Um, so, what kind of investigations would you go on to do? OGD. OGD. Barium swallow. CT thorax. CT thorax, absolutely. Why would you do a CT? Absolutely, staging, really important. So we work system for investigations. So like blood tests, imaging. Blood tests, imaging, and functional tests. So things like parents, well, that's kind of a functional test as well, isn't it? Uh, you can do other sort of functional tests. And you also, you kind of like, you know, people ask you, well, what, what bloods would you do, and why would you do them? And why would you do them? And what types of anemia do you see with people with cancer? Uh, usually like a microcytic anemia. You can have a microcytic anemia which is indicative of what? Uh, GI. A GI lesion which is because of what? Iron deficiency. Iron, iron deficiency. And what other types of anemia do you see with cancer? Normocytic, normochromic. Normocytic, normochromic anemia, absolutely. And what do you see in the acute phase? Say if someone has a massive they have a, uh, cancer, it invades acutely, you have a massive hemoptysis immediately, what type of anemia do you see there? Or do you see anemia? No. No, why not? Because there's no dilution. You don't hemodilute until a bit, little bit later, but it takes a bit of time to pull fluid from your extravascular spaces into your intravascular spaces then to hemodilute up. Okay, so there, you can see a stricture as a barrier swallow. Uh, you clearly see like the stricture that 
like almost like apple pouring, isn't it? Out from a, it's kind of like analogous to what you get with uh, with other types of cancer. But there's the sort of polypoid, mucoid, horrible-looking tumor there seen on the OGD. The other thing to say in your exam is just say, don't say OGD or that kind of thing. Say it's a, what is it? What's the full name for it? Yeah, yeah, so say the full name of it because they like that. And it buys you a bit more time. Uh, again, management, how do you break down management for anything in medicine? Conservative, medical, surgical, and in cancer, palliative, always palliative. What the, so, conservative. The, whole, the question they love to ask in the Oscars, they ask so many times, like when. I did it. Go. Uh, there would be like a GP, and there'd be a, a surgeon there, and then they'd go. So the surgeon would do his bit and say, "Oh, what investigations do you do?" And you, you, you crack through your list, and then it, it flip across the GP, and it was management time, and they'd say, "Right, you're this patient's GP. How are you going to manage this patient? So, what conservative things can you do, who, and who can you involve?" struggling and losing weight. Yeah. Supplements. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Macmillan nurses. nurses, palliative care nurses, absolutely. District nurses. <coughs> Local hospice. Local hospice, absolutely, yeah. What advice are you going to give to family members and that kind of thing? How are you going to approach it? They may even talk about the, how to break bad news. What are the mainstays of medical management? In cancer, chemotherapy, chemotherapy. Radiotherapy. radiotherapy. So chemotherapy may be used before surgery. What's that called? New adjuvant. Yeah. So downstaging the tumor grade before we actually go and try and cut it out and resect it. Uh, and then surgery. And then of course there may be palliative options as well. So there's a palliative surgery as well, which may may we try and you know, they may try and cut out a tumour, they may try and cut off distal vessels so that the people have less risk of bleeding. They almost might stent as well, because not being able to swallow and enjoy your food and having to be peg fed, it's pretty horrible. Not a nice existence. But it does happen. Okay. Uh, so yeah, management is to relieve this patient. Esophageal cancer is not a great prognosis and has a high mortality, I think. One in, uh, as a 5% mortality over 20, uh, 5 years even. The surgery itself has a mortality of 15%. So they use neoadjuvant therapy with that of 5 or uracil. Um, and palliation is a mainstay. <coughs> so there's some little notes about cancer, but you kind of know all that already, right? So problem swallowing case two. So this person instead has got sort of a problem at the back of the throat. What, does anyone know what this problem might be? A pouch. And what's that called? No, a pouch. What type of pouch to get them out of your throat? Pharyngeal pouch. Yeah. So this person's the main thing to remember about parent. So it's just typical of the history, isn't it? Again, if someone asks you the question, you'd say, or you'd go through differential, intraluminal, extraluminal, intraluminal. But then the mainstay of what you do for investigation for pharyngeal pouch is you do a barium swallow first. There's a risk that if you endoscope, endoscope these people, you put down a bougie first. Anyone seen like an endoscopy? See, so it's not not amazing. Have it, has anyone seen it? Yeah, it's pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? You know, definitely go for that midazolam. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's not a particularly nice procedure, but they put down a bougie, don't they? They put down a guide wire. So the risk is that guide wire will then go into the pouch and cause an esophageal rupture. So they kind of stick to the barrier and swallow that's first line. So they get a, the, you get a herniation of the esophagus. There's an incompetency in the, these sort of cricopharyngeus muscles here got some oblique muscles here and some transverse ones here. That's causing the, the problem. So management, they do intra an end of staple. 
they, they, in the past they'd have just gone in and done surgery, but now they just put a couple of staples across and that's it, that's it done. So what about this type of problem? What, what, so a middle-aged woman who's now got a problem with swallowing, it's not always there, a bit intermittent, um, what's the sort of differential? It's quite a wide differential, isn't it? Achalasia. Achalasia is a top, top of differential, absolutely. Globus. Globus, absolutely, yes. Don't forget psychiatric causes. They're definitely used the globus people that turned up in our examples. Anything else? What's common in middle aged women in the Northern Hemisphere? MS is common, isn't it? Uh, okay. Esophageal webs would be up there as well. I think we're thinking about anemia. But this lady's got, what's this here? <laughs> it's there, there, isn't it? So she's got a widened venous steinum. So she's got achalasia. You can do studies to find out, you can do sort of motility studies. You can look at, you can do myometry as well, looking at different pressures between the end of the esophagus and the actual fundus of the, cut, the fundus of the stomach itself to see how the actual flow is going down into the stomach. But does anyone know what achalasia actually is? Or is it just a word that you've heard? And do you know what it is? Loss of peristalsis. Loss of peristalsis with... Not narrowing at the bottom. Inability of the to relax. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Did everyone hear that? So an inability of the actual sphincter able to what happens if it's unable to relax? You've got all that waves of peristalsis hitting the top of the top of the stomach, but if that bit of the bit can't relax, what happens? Dilate. So that's achalasia. So there's different types of things. There's this thing called a heliomyotopia where they just wrap a bit of the fundus around it, provides a bit of support to this structure here. Okay, so a couple of different types of surgical emergency. Uh, have you done up a GI bleed? Yeah. yeah. So you know how to do, manage upper GI bleed and how you get on with it. Would you be scared? <laughs> no? That's how well they were. Has anyone seen one? Has anyone seen a really good upper GI bleed? Yeah. Vomiting loads of blood. And what happens? People call us a cucumber or... Yeah, when they they flap a little bit. Who's in recess? Who's in recess? I don't recess. Pipe off. So yeah, if you well, there's there's the lesson. I think it's one of those things that I think like asthma, asthma can get out of hand pretty quickly. So can a number of GI bleeds. So it's one of those sort of places where you have quite a low threshold for getting your seniors involved. Uh, the main thing I wanted to draw your attention to is that. Up until recently, sort of ulcers were man are now managed me medically, aren't they? What's the mainstay of management for a, a, a just a normal run-of-the-mill ulcer that's not perforated? So you have two antibiotics in your your protein pump inhibitor, isn't it? But there are indications still for surgery. And before they used to use surgery, didn't they? they used to do lots of different types of surgery, you know, take up which the stomach and all sorts. But now, then, but now there's one main indication for surgery. Does anyone know what it is? Persistent bleeding. Persistent bleeding and re-bleeding, absolutely. And where do people re-bleed? It's, yeah, it's, it, it's in, at the rear here. It's, it's, the gastroduodenal artery, apparently, is renowned for re-bleeding. So the site of rebleed is probably the most important factor. Do you know of any scores you can help to calculate the risk of rebleeding? A rockable score. So 
mainstay of management is shock, isn't it? And the different types of shock. And depending on how much circulating volume that you've lost, if you're starting to lose a third to more than a third of your circulating volume, it's bad news, isn't it? <laughs> um, you, what sort of symptoms you're going to have if you're starting to lose that amount of volume? Confusion, sweaty, tachycardic, you're starting to move into sort of coma territory here, aren't you? Whereas you're sort of losing, you can, you're just confused here. Can anyone, and how would you accurately tell if some, how much volume people are losing? Is there a way to accurately tell? No. And who do you want to involve if someone starts to really start to lose their volume in a big bad way? I need to test, so what can they do? Sorry? Yeah, you can yeah, you can help get them to help manage an airway, but that's sort of more sort of in an upper GI bleed situation. You, you can use, yeah, if you've got a variceal bleed, an upper GI bleed, you can do a balloon tamponade. Yeah, that is a way of managing an upper GI bleed. And you can do things at endoscopy, yeah. But what's the anaesthetist going to do for you in this situation? It's going to put a CVP line in, isn't it? That's, a quick, that's, and that's the most valuable way of getting this kind of problem sorted. So crash calls go out early. In a massive, in a massive way. Uh, what sign do you see with an upper GI bleed? Uh, sorry, a perforated duodenal, a perforated duodenal. So you see areas of diaphragm. So you know all this stuff. You've been through it. Did you get a lecture on this already? Upper GI bleeds. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the most valuable bit of information to draw your attention to is that someone that does have a upper GIB, the most important thing to do is correct their clotting. Uh, the person doing the endoscopy is not going to thank you if they, they come back and they've got like an INR of six or seven. They want, they'll want to know that their INR is in a good range because they can't do anything about it until they've corrected the clotting. So if they want warfarin, vitamin K, and that kind of stuff, or octoplex, fresh frozen plasma, whatever you can do to try and stop the bleeding, that's important as well. Um, just when, you know, while they're bombing in the car to get into the hospital in the middle of the night. Okay, another surgical emergency. Does anyone know what this is? Doesn't project very well, but... Yeah. If, does anyone have a system? <laughs> How would you approach it? What would you say? It's a ruptured esophagus, yeah. So you'd say this is a patient X taken on this day. Yeah. It's a chest radiograph. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. Yeah. Uh, how can you tell it's a ruptured esophagus? What, what's the giveaway? It's, a bit, it's very subtle. So esophagus is over here, isn't it? But Effectively, you've got just round here. You've got air, and you've got air trapped and tracking down here. What's it called where air tracks in a place where it's not supposed to be, either under the skin or under the muscles? What? Surgical emphysema. Surgical emphysema. And has anyone felt surgical emphysema? What does it feel like? Bubble wrap. Bubble wrap, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. I mean, it is that, but you say the most striking abnormality is consolidation of the left lobe with possible effusion with uh, surgical emphysema of the uh, mediastinum, as I said, back this to be esophageal rupture. Uh, what's, what else is it called, <coughs> esophageal rupture? Four halves. Four halves. And how is it caused and what's it caused by? Vomiting. Vomiting, yeah. Or going back to our pharyngeal pouch. 
and someone who's put a bougie down it. Iatrogenic. Iatrogenic, so that's the second most. So vomiting and iatrogenic are the two most common causes. Um, what's the difference then between a mallory vice tear and a full on esophageal rupture then? Mallory vice tear only partial um, lumen tear. Yeah, so it's a partial thickness. So mallory vice only partial thickness of esophageal ruptures all the way through. And the, the plexus of uh, blood vessels which run in the submucoses, sub you know, it's very well perfused, so that's why you get such profuse hematemesis with Marie Weiss. Uh, when you rupture your esophagus, you're going to get loads of bugs in there. You get this thing called mediastinitis, which you need to give broad spectrum antibiotics and possibly an antifungal. But the main thing you want to do is keep a little white mouth. Uh, obviously, give them an NG tube uh, and send them to the ICU. What's the NG tube? Uh, the NG tube then is, uh, I suppose, because you're going to get blood going down, tracking down into the esophagus. I suppose it's to just provide a bit of, to provide a way to bypass the esophagus, I presume. Um, I, I suppose that's the logic of it. <coughs> Uh, you need then surgical, which may be to provide a fistula or to do debridement of the mediastinum itself. Okay, final case. So, uh, housewife, mid acutely, 12 hours before, suddenly gone to bed and she experienced acute abdominal pain, vomit up a supper, pains recur every few minutes, colicking, getting worse making her really unwell, doubling up, sick as a dog, vomited more times, now greenish, bilish, horrible looking stuff. Bowel's not acted and she's absolutely constipated, not passing flavours. Ten years, she's had her appendix removed as a surge, as an emergency through paramedia sign incision and she's describing colicky pain for every few minutes. Um, what are you going to look for in an examination of this lady? What's what, you, what are you going to explain to your senior? So you're there, just, you know, you've admitted somebody, someone's been admitted, come at your wards, let's say, um, Reg is in theatre and you need to give a, a quick handover and what you're going to say. Got someone who's sick as a dog. Heart stop by every day in theatre. <laughs> no? I'm well, 56 year old lady. Query small, Query small bowel obstruction. Query small bowel obstruction. What would your findings be on examination, do you think? Tinkling bowel sounds. Tinkling bowel sounds. Or if you're unlucky? No, 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 bowel, no bowel sounds, which is a sign of? Pariatic. pariatic illness, yeah. Rigid, tender abdomen. Is this all ringing some kind of bells? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So yeah, somebody who's possibly hemodynamically stable, maybe <coughs> unstable, maybe dehydrated, uh, tender rigid abdomen, absence bound problems, like you said, taking mouth sounds. You may see waves of peristalsis. You want to know if they've had a PR? Why do you want to know if they've got a PR? You want to see if there's any feces. Anyone see if there's any feces, absolutely, any blood? And herniations anywhere, anywhere else. How do you think you describe a whole obstruction? Have we got a system to try and deal with it? Middle of the tube, wall of the tube, external. Yeah, so intramural, extramural, intramural. Yeah. So can anyone think of like small bowel obstruction? Causes that, like, can anyone put them into those categories? Okay, so, okay. always a good one, isn't it? Can be intramural, intramural, extramural, anything else? Adhesions. Adhesions, commonest cause of small bowel obstruction, yeah? Hernia, second commonest cause of small bowel obstruction, yeah. Interception. So, so yeah, what's interception? You don't see it mainly in adults, you see it in kids, what's that? Intercept. 
Imagination of the bowel. Yeah, a telescoping, isn't it, of the bowel itself. Okay. So, yeah, so extramural will be adhesions, actual twisting of the bowel itself, volvulus, happens in old people. Strangulated hernias, which will be, you know, an indication for acute surgery. Get rid of loads of debris. What would you do if someone, what you expected someone had a strangulated hernia? Someone's sick and parasitic and looks awful. What what investigations would you do? Blood gas. Blood gas. What, and what would you look for in the blood gas? High lactate. High lactate. Absolutely. Yeah. Intramural causes. Absolutely. And an infarction. Another thing to put your lactate up. Strictures. Inflammation. Luminal. So yeah. Poo. Foreign <coughs> bodies. Polyps. And other things. Uh, so this is now abdominal x-rays, anyone want to describe it? Quickly. What's the most it's very simple, you just go, this is an abdominal film of Joe Bloggs taken on so and so. The most striking abnormality is Multiple loops of small bowel distributed in the peripheries of the abdomen. I can tell it's small bowel because because of your valvier conjuventi, which cross the bowel itself, rather than your what would you see if it was large bowel? Your horse which don't cross, do they? They go about a third way across. Uh, how would you manage this patient? Yeah, so what would you what would you say in your exam? I know you've done it to death. You do your A B C D E and what? Drip So does someone say NG tube? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you put an NG tube in as well. And what do you want it under? What's the word that they like to hear? Someone say it, someone pipe up? Someone say free suction? I won't get a credit for myself, but no. So you're under free suction. What does that mean? It means that you just put a, it's under a filter so it's always free running. How do you want to resuscitate the patient? Fluids. Fluids, yeah, why? What happens in small bowel obstruction? Fluids wise. What happens to where does the fluid go? Why? It just gathers in the bowel. Gathers in the bowel, and why? Because there's no, yeah, there's no, there's no fluid going anywhere. There's no, the, the, it's, the large bowel's not taking anything in. You've got more, a more higher protein load and loads of stuff in there, which just like draws in fluid from your intravascular space to your extravascular space. Does that make sense? Has anyone lost the will to live? <laughs> <laughs> Any well, now what's that? A while ago. A while ago. All right. But any questions? Anything that anyone wants to ask? Anyone wants? To, anyone not sure about anything that they've been told recently and put to bed now? You said on one of the slides it's worse if it's solids and not liquids for dysphagia for it to be like a, a red flag. Symptom. Why specifically not liquids? Well, what what do you think the mechanism is? I'm gonna throw it back to you. Why with so it's, so it's more like to do with the history, it's more to do with the progression of the symptoms yeah. to what you can deal with. Yeah. So you might might be able to tolerate solids and then and liquids. Then you might not be able to tolerate solids, but you may be able to tolerate liquids. And it's the progression of those symptoms which dictate the sort of the narrow, narrowing of the aperture of the esophagus yeah. over a period of time that puts it more in the ballpark of right. cancer. So it's nothing particular. There's nothing particular about solids itself. It's more about just the overall picture of the history. Um, is a barium enema always first line investigation? For. 
for dysphagia, it depends. It is first line investigation for pharyngeal harsh, but most other things, and certainly if you're suspecting cancers, most first line investigation would be to normal no. And not another enema, yeah, it's not a barium swallow. But that won't necessarily be a barium swallow for if you're suspecting cancer, what would it be? Do what do you think they'd do? OGD, sorry. O OGD, and why do they do OGD? What do you need for a cancer diagnosis? Because you need a tissue diagnosis, don't you? You need clinical diagnosis. For any, for any cancer, you need tissue diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, radiological diagnosis, which are all discussed in your MDT. Yeah? So those two things. So you'll definitely need a staging CT, you'll definitely need endoscopy plus biopsy. Anything else? Anything else in medicine you're not sure about? Lots. Anything that keeps anyone up at night about anything? Any subjects that keeps you?